it's Dr. Ken here with my teaching assistant Bear who's going to help me talk to you about social relations, uh, gender, age, sex, and marriage in no, Chaucer's no, no, England. No, 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 no. These are all themes that figure prominently into uh, Chaucer. And the themes for today, I should say, are immorality, marriage, the status of women, uh, families and children, old age and youth, and what was Chaucer's attitude about these things. So we'll take these, these one by one, looking at the sort of evidences that we've got. Um, my teaching assistant will either remain or go, depending on her inclination, uh, but we'll, we'll work through these ideas. Now, the, few, the next few images that you're going to see are from various things like misericords. These that you're looking at now are misericords, which are seats for the clergy to, to lean against or even sit upon when they're performing certain prayers um, and, and masses for people, often paid for by people, perhaps for the purposes of getting them out of purgatory. Um, Trintles, 30 masses, could be paid for. But the, so they had to have seats to sit upon or lean against. You'll notice the images depict um, rather secular things. So something to do with men and women, marriage and sex. Um, and yeah, it's a good question as to why, um, <laughs> why is it that these things are finding their way into clerical context. And um, as, as I keep saying, we will be looking at the church in more detail later on, but we'll also get some sense of their attitude towards sexual relations at the moment. Um, so we'll think about immorality uh, and, and what this means. Uh, the first one, and I've alluded to this before, but it concerns a controversial topic, uh, charges of rape leveled against Geoffrey Chaucer and Edward III. Now, um, in the case of Edward III, it, it sounds like it might have been made up. We'll come back to that in a moment. <clears throat> In the case of Chaucer, uh, it's not so clear. So there's a legal record from 1380, when Chaucer would have been approaching about 40 years old, uh, concerning an alleged rape. Uh, the, in, in, in this Latin record, a certain Cecilia Champagne agrees to release a certain Geoffrey Chaucer from all further legal actions concerning de raptu meo, which translates to on account of my rape. Um, there has been much speculation about whether this was indeed sexual rape. Uh, might it have been some sort of abduction, because of course the word has that meaning as well and doesn't always imply sexual content, at least in, in the earlier usages of it. Was Chaucer merely standing in for one of his highborn friends, or the, maybe in the royal family? Was he taking the fall for someone else? I don't know. Was Cecilia Champagne a credible accuser? Having so little information about this, it's quite difficult to determine. I mean, those of us who, who read Chaucer and, and enjoy his works, you know, and think of him as quite an innovator, might be inclined to to try and you know acquit him of this of this crime. Uh, we don't want him to be a rapist, but we don't know. Anything's possible. Um, we simply don't know more than the sparse record shows, and it shows that Chaucer acknowledges and eventually pays uh, a debt of 10 pounds, a sum equal to approximately half of his yearly wage as a customs official. Um, until we get some evidence to the contrary, it seems best not to make excuses for Chaucer. Given the few records that do relate to this incident, it seems best to assume that Chaucer was probably accused of sexual rape as well. The fact that he was willing to pay a substantial sum to settle out of court suggests that he may have acknowledged some guilt we can probably never know for sure about Chaucer's famous rape case, however, uh, and we are left to speculate about who this Cecilia Champagne woman was and what sort of relationship Chaucer had with her. So little is known about Chaucer's personal life that we can be sure of almost nothing about his relationship with his wife, let alone uh, with a woman about whose parentage and situation we know next to nothing. So. This, this is a curious thing. Did, did, again, we don't know, did Chaucer rape her? Was it um, you know, a case of, of, of having kidnapped the woman? Was it a case of having, uh, she was actually raped by someone else and Chaucer took the blame? All the bare bones records say is that he acknowledges his guilt and pays this fee. 
um, until more information emerges we can't know. But it's, it's interesting and it's somewhat disturbing. Edward III also gets accused of rape. Um, he's supposed to have raped and battered the Countess of Salisbury, perhaps at Nottingham, uh, but this was possibly a piece of French propaganda from the Hainault chronicler John Lebel, uh, written as an attempt to cast a slight upon the King of England. Lebel's narrative is full of errors and, and when compared to the sources. For Sartre, um, our French chronicler who lives in England, uh, says of the alleged affair the following. He says, you have heard me speak above of Edward's love for the Countess of Salisbury. The chronicle of Jean Lebel speaks of this love less properly than I must. For please God, I would never, it would never enter my head to incriminate the King of England and the Countess of Salisbury with such a vile accusation. If respectable men ask why I mention that love, they should know that Jean Lebel relates in his chronicle that the English king raped the Countess of Salisbury. Now I declare that uh, I know England well, where I have lived for long periods, mainly at the royal court and also with the great lords of that country, and I have never heard tell of this rape, though I have asked people about it who must have known if it, if it had ever happened. Moreover, I cannot believe that uh, it is, in, uh, and it is incredible that so great and valiant a man as the King of England would have allowed himself to dishonor one of the most noble ladies of his realm and one of his knights who had served him so royally, so loyally um, all his life, so her husband. Um, again, we don't know. It sounds a bit like the, this French chronicler may have been making propaganda against the king, although it is known that the king um, fancied younger ladies, and he was certainly cheating on his wife with Alice Perros, whom we'll come to in a bit. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that he may have had some sort of sexual affair with the Countess of Salisbury, whether called a rape, whether it was rape or not, we don't know. Um, my inclination, based purely on, on gut instinct and, and, and not evidence, unfortunately, which is lacking, is that Edward may well have raped the Countess of Salisbury, and Chaucer probably didn't rape Cecilia Champagne. But again, we don't. We simply don't know. Clearly, these are cases of sexual immorality, though, and a point of concern. You'll remember um, the the other the references we had earlier to, to, to court to church court and manorial fines. So I've, I've talked about the Legerwhite before that was in use before the Norman invasion of 1066 and still in use in the 14th century. And it was a fine levied upon villains, serfs, peasants for cohabitation payable annually to their lord. Um, so. They, they could have these sexual relations without his, his permission, so long as they paid a fine. The child white or child wit was a fine paid by a man to a lord for unlawfully impregnating his bondswoman. The term also selectively uh, used of, of free women too, who fell into that sort of a category um, of, of, of a manorial um, tenant. So, uh, interesting, it's paid to the lord of the manor and not to the, the woman herself or her family. So, what is the right way, what is, what is correct sexual morality? Well, celibacy was the ideal way to conduct one's life um, and, and sex was condoned only as part of marriage. This is the official view. Premarital sex or extramarital sex was a serious risk. Um, priests were required to report adulterers and fornicators those having sex outside of marriage, and punishments could range from years uh, of doing penance to, to death, depending on the extremity. In reality, though, there was a more lenient attitude, especially in rural populations where sexual dalliances were apparently routine. Often, the priest would try to force the sinners, quote-unquote, to marry, and all would be forgiven. If marriage was out of the question, punishments could involve, again, uh, lots of penances. We see disregards for the strictures of, of sexual morality in the Miller's Tale, as we've already seen, in the Wife of Bath's Tale, which we shall see, which involves a rape, um, in the Reeves' Tale and the Merchant's Tale, too. So, um, as with many things, there's a gap between the real and the ideal here.
So I've mentioned the church. Um, their mission, apparently, is to root out immorality in all sexual intercourse. Uh, and it's fair to say the medieval church was obsessed with sex. Uh, to quite a painful, I think, and an, an unhealthy degree. Sexual issues dominated its thinking in a manner which we should regard as entirely pathological. It's hardly too much to say that the ideal which is held out, which, it, which the church held out for Christians, was primarily a sexual ideal. That this ideal was highly consistent, a highly consistent one, and was embodied in a most elaborate code of regulations. This code was based quite simply upon the conviction that the sexual act was to be avoided like the plague, except for the bare minimum necessary to keep the race in existence. Even when performed for this purpose, um, it remained a regrettable necessity. Those who could were exhorted to avoid, avoid it entirely, even if married. For those incapable of such heroic self-denial, there was a, a great spider's web of reg regulations uh, whose overriding purpose was to make the sexual act as joyless as possible and to restrict the performance to the minimum. And, and with this sort of attitude, it's not surprising that, that lots of rapes occurred or that clergy um, didn't obey the rules of chastity themselves. So the idea is to restrict sex exclusively to the function of procreation. It was not actually the sexual act which was damnable, but the pleasure derived from it. And this pleasure remained damnable even when the act was performed for the purposes of procreation, a notion which reached its crudest expression in the invention of the chemise carousse, a sort of heavy nightshirt uh, with a suitably placed hole for a woman, although which the husband, through which a husband could impregnate his wife while avoiding any other physical contact. The belief that even within marriages the sexual act should not be performed for pleasure still persists to the present uh, day, more especially in the, in the Catholic Church, where it remains official doctrine. It has been publicly reasserted in modern times by modern popes. Uh, although maybe the current one is taking a different approach to this, I don't know. He seems to be in some respects. The Church's moral code comprised several main propositions. Firstly, uh, who, those who could were urged to attempt the complete ideal of celibacy, the ideal of complete celibacy. Um, while, the, while for the priests this was obligatory, uh, the second, although it wasn't obligatory until about the 5th century AD, and it doesn't seem to have been widely uh, adhered to either until about the time of the Reformation, interestingly enough. Anyway, the... Um, the second step was to place an absolute ban on all forms of sexual activity other than intercourse between married persons carried out with the object of procreating, as I've said. There are books of penitentials which indicate penances for various sins, and in some of these, fornication was declared worse than murder as a sin. But it wasn't the sexual act alone that was taboo. Uh, attempting to fornicate, kissing, even thinking about fornication, were forbidden and called for penalties. In the last case, the penance was 40 days uh, of, of, of reciting prayers or paternosters. Uh, nor was it the intention alone which made the crime. Involuntary nocturnal pollutions, as they're called, were a sin. The offender had to rise at once and sing seven penitential psalms with a further 30 in the morning. If the pollution occurred when he had fallen asleep in church, he had to sing the whole psalter, which is the church service, essentially. The penitentials also devoted a disproportionately large amount of their space to prescribing penalties for homosexuality and bestiality. Uh, but the sin upon which the greatest stress of all was placed, surprise, surprise, was masturbation. Um, in the five comparatively short medieval penitential codes, there are 22 paragraphs dealing with with various degrees of sodomy and bestiality, and no fewer than 25 dealing with masturbation on the part of laymen, to say nothing of others uh, dealing separately, like priests, but in dealing separately with masturbation on the part of clergy. Because it gives pleasure, you see, it's, it's unacceptable. No content, uh, not content rather with this, the church proceeded to cut down the number of days per year upon which even married couples might legitimately perform the sexual act. Firstly, it had to be uh, it had been made illegal on Sundays, Wednesdays and Fridays, which effectively removed the equivalent of five months out of the year. Then it was made illegal for 40 days before Easter and 40 days before Christmas, and for three days before attending communion, and uh, there were regulations requiring frequent attendance to communion. Uh, 
It was also forbidden for, from the time of, co of, of conception to 40 days after parturation, which is probably not a bad thing, actually, in the case of women. Um, it was, of course, forbidden during any penance being served. So it was more like the, the number of days a year when one could engage in legitimate sexual relations were very few and far between, and one needed essentially a lawyer to determine when that would be the case. So um, the church even dictated how you were supposed to have sex. They went as far as to, to define allowed positions. Anything other than the common missionary position, for example, is considered unnatural and therefore a sin. According to the church, the, the woman on top position, or entering her from the rear, called sexotergo, was not favored because they interfered with the natural order of male-female roles. Anal and oral sex were sins because they could only be practice for pleasure, uh, not procreation, which uh, for the purists was the only purpose of sex. Punishments uh, for those using deviant sexual positions could be very harsh. Three years penance for the woman on top of the, uh, on top and the same for uh, both oral intercourse and sex atergo, which was generally seen as the most sinful position uh, with, the, with the possible exception of anal intercourse. There were um, the official idea, these were the official ideas of the church, as I say, but some progressive, quote unquote, theologians began to question these. Albertus Magnus, 1193 to about 1280, um, named five sexual positions and ranked them from most acceptable to least acceptable. So the first was missionary, two side by side, three sitting, four standing, and five sex atergo. Magnus said that the missionary was the only completely natural position. The others were morally questionable, uh, but not morally sinful. In certain situations, however, such as physical health conditions or, or whatever, these other positions could not only be acceptable, but even practical. Um, the church gave an awful lot of thought to, to sexual matters, considering that they weren't supposed to engage in sex themselves. Um, and like I say, particularly for someone uh, engaging in sex for pleasure uh, and, and, and as I say the, the worst the most serious form was masturbation but so so falling asleep in church and having an erection for a man would be you know a, a very severe sin deserving of, of, a, of a major penalty and the topic of sexual relations is quite prominent in Chaucer so there's the marriage group of the Canterbury Tales we have the Wife of Bath's prologue and tale, which seems to put forward the notion that women should dominate their husbands, which is interesting, um, especially when it's told contrary to the, the Oxford scholar's tale, the Clark's tale, about Walter and Griselda. Um, Walter, who abuses his wife by pretending to kill her children to test her loyalty, um, and yet she patiently puts up with it. Even Chaucer says that this is not uh, the the ideal way for, for a person to behave. The Franklin's Tale, um, perhaps a slightly more optimistic vision of marriage. Um, we Basically, in summary, there's a character named uh, Arvergus, who's a young knight who becomes the husband to a woman named Dorgan. Dorgan will sleep with Aurelius, another man, if he can make the black rocks off the coast disappear. Aurelius, the young clerk who loves Dorgan, but, but ultimately realizes her for, releases her from her promise. Uh, so it, it's a case of one man loving another man's wife, and she makes an unrealistic promise um, that he eventually releases her from. The Merchant's Tale, which depicts uh, an issue of old age and, and uh, of an elderly husband and a young bride and the problems that occur with that. We've seen this theme already in the Miller's Tale. Um, and even in the tales that aren't part of the marriage group, the subject of marriage comes up and, and sexual immorality. I'll come back to um, January and May from the, the merchant's tale in a bit. What about marriage? Um, arranged marriages were quite common amongst members of the upper classes, and women had very little choice in, in whom their husbands might be. Marriages were frequently arranged so that both families involved would benefit financially and, and socially. Marriages would be arranged to bring prestige or wealth to the family of noble individuals. Uh, and marriage for love at that level seems to have been a very rare occurrence, although 
Looking at some of Chaucer's characters, uh, marriages of love are not out of the question for people maybe a bit lower down on the hierarchy. Um, we are uncertain about Chaucer himself, although it's entirely probable that Geoffrey Chaucer's own marriage to Philippa de Rote, um, a high-class lady-in-waiting, was probably an arranged marriage. Um, so there's the case of John Chaucer, that's the, Geoffrey Chaucer's father. He was vintner and, and deputy to a, a vintner, a wine merchant and deputy to the king's butler. His family's financial success came from work in the wine and leather business, and he married a woman named Agnes Copton, an heiress from another London merchant family. This was probably an arranged marriage. Um, so Chaucer's own parents, probably an arranged marriage. At that level of the middle classes, at the higher end of the middle classes, they're imitating the, 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 roy the royalty and aristocracy with arranged marriages. Note that Chaucer's merchant is also a vintner. So is there something autobiographical going on here? Um, we can look at another example of arranged marriage at the level of aristocracy, and that's Princess Isabella and Count Louis de la Male. Uh, so this has to do with the aspirations of Edward III and, and his, his goals for, for continental control or conquest. In early March of 1347, Edward III wanted an alliance with Flanders. Um, and he traveled with Princess Isabel, described as an overindulgent, willful, and wildly extravagant child from England to Calais, so this is the king's presumably daughter, uh, and then to Flanders, where Isabel was betrothed to the 15-year-old Count Louis de la Male of Flanders. Uh, and the marriage date was set for the first week in April. However, the bridegroom apparently didn't want the marriage. His father, having been killed in, by the English at Crecy, uh, he was held in courteous prison until he agreed to the marriage. So essentially this, this young nobleman was locked away under house arrest um, in effect until he agreed to the marriage. Uh, so he agreed but then he fled while out hawking the week before the marriage and went straight to King Philippe IV of France uh, who was overjoyed to see him and had him, had him immediately engaged to marry Margaret of Brabant, daughter of the Duke of Brabant. According to Jean de Venette, a song was written and sung across France with the lyric, I have lost him whose love I was given to be, um, about Princess Isabel. Um, in 1349, Edward III attempted but failed to bring a match for Isabella and Charles IV of Bohemia, who was a widower and had been elected but not yet consecrated emperor. In 1360, so that's an example of the kind of, of, of the way that a royal family uses its members, its female members especially, but also its male ones too, uh, to uh, forge alliances and um, advance their fortunes. Chaucer, as I mentioned, marries Philippa de Rode in 1366. She was lady-in-waiting to the queen, sister of John of Gaunt's third wife. However, none of Chaucer's poetry is addressed to his wife, so it's assumed that this was essentially an arranged marriage. Very little of what Chaucer wrote was complimentary towards marriage, and we do wonder, um, especially in the case of his rape trial, was it, was it the case that he had an affair with a woman who then accused him of rape later to get money out of him because he was unhappy with his wife? I don't know. Again, I'm, I'm trying to acquit Chaucer, but I don't know. Um, what constitutes a good marriage? Well, um, we can think about the example of uh, Chaucer's own children, the good marriage, again, having to do more with financial gain than with actual love. So Thomas Chaucer uh, was the eldest son of Geoffrey Chaucer by his wife, Philippa. Philippa was the daughter of, of Sir, Sir Payne Rote and sister of Catherine Swinford, mistress and afterwards wife of John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster. Early in life, uh, Thomas Chaucer married Matilda, the second daughter and co-heiress of John Burgersh, Lord Curdiston, the nephew of Henry Burgersh, the Bishop of, Lin of Lincoln. Uh, by the way, saying he was the bishop's nephew might be a way of saying he was actually the bishop's son. Uh, the word nepos is Latin for nephew, and it's where we get the word nepotism. Often clergy, high-ranking clergy, would have lots of nephews, um, and they would end up getting promoted in positions, usually uh, in court. So, so this may have been a bishop's son, anyway. Uh, 
uh, and he, the bishop was treasurer and chancellor of the kingdom. He, this marriage brought Thomas Chaucer large estates, central to which was the manor of Ulm in, in Oxfordshire. Thomas then, because of, of his elevated status, was able to sit as a member of parliament for Oxfordshire, uh, and, you know, owning territory, owning, owning land there, 14 times between 1400 and 1431. He was chosen as Speaker of the House of Commons in the Parliament that met at Gloucester in 1407. Thomas died in, on the 14th of March, 1438, was buried at Ulm, where his widow, who died in 1436, was also buried. They had a fine brass memorial uh, in the parish church. He was a very wealthy man, for in the list drawn up two years after his death, of those from whom the, the council proposed to borrow money for the war in France, he was put down for 200 pounds, the largest sum asked from any of those uh, on the list, except for four of the richest individuals in the kingdom. So Thomas Chaucer, Geoffrey Chaucer's son, had a good marriage. And I'll come back to um, his granddaughter, Chaucer's granddaughter, Alice, in a bit, because she also has a good marriage in the sense of, of bringing financial prosperity um, and rise in status. So on to the topic of the nature of marriage. Um, grooms on average tend to be much older than their wives. This isn't unusual in, in the ancient and medieval world. Um, noble women sometimes didn't marry until the age of 24, but this was rare. More than three-fourths were married before they reached the age of 19. By today's standards, Western Europe pardon me, was inhabited by the young, Thanks to the Black Death, we reckon more than half the population was under 20 years of age, which um, and, and it wasn't always the case, but during this century after the Black Death, that's, that seems to have been. And one sort of upshot of this seems to be that there's a, people are behaving a lot more childishly, those who survive. Um, we can decide whether we think that's the case or not. What about the role of women? Well, um, the woman was, was sometimes considered chattel, um, like property, not exactly property, but like property. So women were, who were expected to take on considerable household responsibilities were accorded a very lowly status in the law. They were classed as chattels, effectively, not literally, but legally the property of their fathers before marriage and of their husbands after it. Once wed, a wife came under the rod, so to speak, or control of her husband. He could do what he, he liked with her property, even sell it against her wishes. She couldn't appear in court unless he accompanied her, and she needed his consent um, if she wanted to make a will. So it, it's a pretty lowly status, but as we'll see, um, there are some interesting advantages that women could take, unfortunately. Um, you know, it's not equality, but they are able to... If they, if they are able to, they, they, they can take advantage of. What about the husband? Well, the word husband comes from husband, and this is an old Norse word that literally means house owner, homeowner. That's the husband. Um, so wives were expected to produce children, submit to their husband's authority. They would be instructed from an early age that their gender was weak and sinful, deceitful due to the first sin of Eve. Um, against Adam. The medieval wife was kept in a recluse in her own home. Um, the only choice for women other than marriage really was life in a nunnery. Although again, the, the wife of Bath, well, she's, she's, she's taken marriage as a choice, but she, um, she certainly uh, takes advantage of it. She might be the exception though. What is the marriage debt? Right, so this is an interesting concept that's a bit strange to us. The debt of marriage. Um, it's like a monetary debt. The marriage debt was something that was owed by one person to another. But, and this is, this is another area where the church's uh, regulations interfere in private life. According to canon law, unlike a monetary, and canon law is the church law, unlike a monetary debt, the marriage debt was a mutual obligation owed by spouses to one another by virtue of the sacrament of marriage and not by virtue of some exchange for value. The marriage debt was the mutual duty shared by husband and wife to perform sexually at each other's request. It was to be granted freely by one spouse upon the need of the other, but again, presumably only on the days that they were allowed to do it. The conjugal obligation served to keep the marriage bond solidified through the sexual union of husband and wife. The wife 
had as equal a right as the husband to exact payment of the debt. Neither spouse had the right to withhold its payment. So it's not exactly the best conceivable relationship, but it is interesting that the woman has every right to demand it from her husband as well, should she wish. Each partner in marriage then is considered both debtor and creditor in, in this arrangement. When the words of the marriage ceremony were spoken at the church door, uh, the two to be joined in marriage promised to perform sexually at each other's request, essentially. Not in those words precisely, but in effect. This was part of canon law, the law of the church, and it's been pointed out um, that this is well reflected in, in, in a number of Chaucer's tales. The wife of Bath alludes to uh, the marriage debt. So this is an interesting phenomenon um, and will be interpreted clearly differently by individuals. But it's interesting, the church, on the one hand, thinks of sex as bad, and yet on the other hand, makes it a mutual obligation of married couples. So it's, it's showing some contradictory or, or paradoxical relationships here. Um, I've included mystery plays uh, because these illustrate certain stereotypes or ideas, or ideals rather, about... Um, behavior of men and women. So the mystery plays and, and miracle plays are performed to, to usually illustrate either things from, from the li events from the lives of saints um, or events from the Bible, usually around the life of Jesus. But, but events like Noah's flood, for example, that's a popular one. Um, and in these, especially the one about Noah's flood, uh, shrewish wives uh, appear a lot. So Mrs. Noah in the mystery plays is, is identified as an indomitable scold who would not leave her gossips and, and get into the ark at her husband's bidding even though the whole world was descending, drowning the flood. So she's just she's identified as being intractable, violent, sharp-tongued, um, and some of the characters in, in the mystery plays are fond of cuckolding their husbands as well as merely ordering them about. We find examples of this in, you know, going back to Roman uh, comedies as well, but and then they, they, they end up in Shakespeare with um, in, like, the Taming of the Shrew is a good example of that. So there's this sort of notion that the man has to tame his wife somehow, uh, put her under control. The approved remedy for a domineering wife was physical violence. Um, the more ingenious and excruciating, the better. So the law allowed a husband, within degrees, to physically abuse his wife. Now, um, on the other hand, this, this, this could, oddly enough, the law could work to the wife's advantage. It didn't recognize a wife maltreating her husband as a crime. So if a wife was stronger than her husband, she could abuse him all she wanted, and he could do nothing against her legally. Um, he, he, if, if he was abused by her and could not defend himself, he'd be the laughing stock of the community if, if he made it known. So what we're seeing, you know, we're not, we don't have a lot of details into people's private lives, although we'll see a little bit in the wife of Bath's prologue um, where, where she and her husband beat up each other um, at one point, and uh, I think it's num husband number five, if I'm not mistaken. So it's, it's, yeah, a disturbing thing to think about, but, but this is the way the society worked. And, and, and again, actual relationships will have varied. In the Canterbury Tales, there's what's called anti-matrimonialism present in many of Chaucer's characters, like the miller and the merchant. Not just them, the host, Harry Bailey, expresses this view, or expresses something like it. Husbands fearing their wives... Um, or being afraid to ask too many questions about their wives' sexual activities. So it's, it's not entirely all about men subjugating women. The system seems to have designed, have inbuilt into it these, these sorts of, of contradictions and or avenues of behavior, um, and a whole range of which you know would probably compare to, to modern domestic disharmony as well in many respects. Um, they, they're not the domestic harmony and trust between married people are not particularly evident in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Let's think about the status and attitude uh, to women 
why is it that, that women have this lowly status? They can typically be maidens, wives, nuns, and widows. These are the types of, of women. Um, only widows and aged spinsters seem to achieve a measure of independence, although, well, the wife of Bath is approaching that sort of age. But even widows are, are usually categorized according to the status of their deceased husbands. And remember that on, on, on a manor, if a serf's husband dies, she's expected to remarry so that he can do the labor. Presumably once they're older, that's acceptable if they don't, but you, any, you know, up to a certain point, they're still expected to marry. So independence is not nigh. Women seem to be constantly the victims of sexual prejudice and they're blamed for all the physical, intellectual, and moral weaknesses of society. Um, so blaming Eve for tempting Adam and then invoking that story whenever possible. Is there misogyny in Chaucer? I think there is amongst his characters, not clear if it's from Chaucer himself. So um, the wife of Bath refers to Adam and Eve saying the Bible was a text wherein we find that women was the ruin, woman was the ruin of mankind. Um, and you find this, this sort of attitude being uh, formalized in treatises by scholars at the time. So according to a 13th century treatise translated into English in the 14th century, women are considered smaller, meeker, more demure, more gentle, more supple and more delicate than men, but they are also more envious, more laughing and loving, um, and the malice of the soul is more in a woman than a man. The author goes on to say uh, that such such that, that a woman is of feeble nature, t tells more lies, and is slower in working and moving than a man. So formalized uh, misogyny, really. There's an Aristotelian dictum widely held at the time that women were, in effect, deformed men. And Aristotle's, and Aristotle was pretty misogynistic as well. His attitudes towards women come to dominate in the medieval period. It's widely understood that women have a physical need for regular sexual intercourse. They, they, they this goes back to the ancient Greeks and Romans, that women lack self-control over sexual matters. Um, but then, naturally, this gets twisted into a more disturbing uh theme so it's understood that based on the writings of the ancient greek physician galen that women must have an orgasm in order to conceive a child so if a woman conceived a child as a consequence of rape it would be considered that she enjoyed the sex act and therefore no rape had actually taken place that would be um a view widely held up until relatively modern times the victorians seem to have forgotten that women could have orgasms uh, but it was widely known up until then that they could Still, this is used uh, to justify, in some cases, rape if the woman got pregnant. How could it be rape if she, yeah, according to Galen? There are a number of Christian teachings on, um, on, on, on women. Some come from St. Augustine, a writer of the 5th century, a scholar of the 5th century AD. Uh, he said that all humans, female, just as much as male, are made according to the image of God. In the component of humanity where there is no distinction of sex, namely the mind, spirit, animus. These are Platonic ideas that Augustine picked up and you know, he, he was a Platonist. Um, although his views don't always dominate and people's interpretation of his views uh, vary. We have Paul's remark in 1 Corinthians about man being the image of, and glory of God while woman is the glory of man seen to be a secondary creation. Um, and this was a real difficulty for Augustine, St. Augustine, precisely because it seems to contradict Genesis 127. And Augustine is unwilling to do what, what, what some say the fathers in general usually do, namely take the verse of Paul at the face value in, to the neglect of Genesis. So th this woman's role created a kind of uh, theological conflict. I put a lot more in the notes um, here about St. Augustine's views on men and women and, and largely he seems to think that their souls are, are equal more or less equal um, but that view wouldn't wouldn't be very popular thomas aquinas uh is one of the more commonly referenced uh on on, on women and, and and he gets his views in no small part from aristotle uh in his summa theologica the question is whether women should have been created in the beginning of the world before the fall of Adam uh, 
and the introduction of sin into the world. Aquinas entertains the objection that because of, the, of her imperfection, woman should not have been part of the original creation. His reply is, yes, woman should have been produced in, in Eden since she was necessarily uh, for the generation of species. Um, he, he, he concedes Aristotle's position that woman is misbegotten or deformed version of man, but only considered an individual and only with respect to the body or matter, but not the soul. So even Aquinas more or less agrees with Augustine on the nature of the soul. I mean, it's, it's interesting that they're using, to us it seems absurd that, that they're, they're thinking about Genesis um, and, and, and also Paul's interpretation. Paul seems to have been fairly misogynistic too uh, about you know, determining the role of women in society based on these things. I mean, I can tell you that scholars have, have decided the book of Genesis was probably written quite a bit later than Exodus um, and may come from the stay in Babylon and may refer to originally to like a Babylonian king named Adam and, and his magical garden the gods would come and visit him in. So it's, a, it's patently absurd to use this to, to, to determine for the whole of society how we should treat women. But this is what they did. Then there are the views of the poets influenced by Christian thinking. Um, there's Petrarch and Dante. And Petrarch, uh, his, it's Laura who's his love interest. She, she's portrayed as, as too lovely for morality. The gods are looking eagerly on her. So she's like a, a, a Virgin Mary type figure. It's something similar with Dante and Beatrix. Uh, the whole reason that Dante goes through hell and purgatory and heaven is to reach his beloved Beatrix. Um, and when he does, all he does is sit at the right hand of God with her. So these poets tend to elevate women to a, a divine, to a Virgin, Virgin Mary type figure. And have been, it's, it's been argued they create a kind of two type model of essentially the Madonna and the whore, that, that women must be one of those two types. Um, and, and, and this is, you know, I, neither is really fair to impose on, on someone, and, and they both set up unrealistic expectations. There is a sense uh, from the wife of Bath, at least, of a, perhaps a male anxiety that women seek mastery over men, um, and, and maybe that men fear women's sexual allure and freedom. So think of Allison in The Miller's Tale or May in The Merchant's Tale. Uh, and these also highlight, and especially in the case of the merchant's tale, um, it highlights a concern amongst the aristocracy over failure to breed. Remember that part of the point of marriage, and one of the big parts of it, is to have heirs, to have offspring, through whom property will pass, or to whom. So the wife is largely there to facilitate this by giving birth to children. We know that a number of monarchs in particular, but not just them, struggled to, to have offspring, um, you know, given infant mortality rates and, 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 and the fact that uh, women frequently died during childbirth. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not uh, surprising they would be concerned with such things, but this figures prominently into attitudes towards sex as well. Is there a kind of post-Black Death feminism? Um, we know that because of you know the, the, the number of deaths as a result of the, of, the, of the plague, more women had to go out into the public sphere and work than it had ever done so before. Um, <clears throat> there are fewer women available for marriage, which gave them a somewhat higher degree of freedom. But they perhaps had a little bit more choice in, in whom they married because they were, they were a, a rare commodity. Um, certainly during the 14th century, there appears to be more prominent female figures. So Queen Isabella of Spain, of France rather, pardon me, that's Edward II's wife, who overthrows him, uh, is one, mother of Edward III. Alice Perros is another, and I'll come to her in, in a bit. We can look at uh, another example of a kind of good marriage and the, and the sort of thing <clears throat> that, uh, that also is a consequence of the Black Death, the fact that, that a commoner like Chaucer could end up uh, marrying his children off to nobility and his grandchildren go even higher. 
So uh, we'll talk a little bit about Alice Chaucer. Now this is this is uh, Chaucer's granddaughter. She was the only child of Thomas Chaucer, married first at the age of only seven to Sir John Philip. Her father purchased Donington Castle for the couple, but Sir John died later the same year in 1415. It's unlikely they, they ever took up residence. Alice married, secondly, Thomas Montague, the fourth Earl of Salisbury, in 1426, or sorry, 28. She had no children by either husband. Thirdly, she was united with uh, William de la Pole, Earl and afterwards Duke of Suffolk, who was beheaded in 1450, as it turns out, by whom she had two sons and a daughter. And uh, you can see images from their magnificent tomb at Yule, and that was the property in Oxfordshire that, that uh, Thomas Chaucer had gotten from his marriage. So Geoffrey Chaucer is connected with Yule through his son Thomas, um, <clears throat> probably because of, of you know his, his close ties with John of Gaunt, and this is what people tried to do. They used connections to advance their lot through marriage. Um, there, there was a rumor, John of Gaunt was Thomas Chaucer's godfather, and there was a rumor that he was really his son, but that's never been proven. That would be interesting if it were the case. In any event, uh, the Chaucer family rose from comparative obscurity, relative obscurity, into high official positions. And the poet Geoffrey Chaucer, of course, having married Philippa de Rote, Flemish lady who came over to England as one of Queen Philippa's attendants, um, that came that gave Chaucer his connection to the court circles or uh, within the royal court um, and soon high favor from the king from Edward III. It should be noted too that there's a further connection with John of Gaunt as Philippa wrote sister Catherine wrote Swinford by her first marriage uh, ended by becoming John of Gaunt's third wife. Um, Thomas Chaucer came into possession of Yulm as I've said through his marriage with Matilda Burgersh, a marriage which uh, which says the old chronicler was much to the great increase of his living and amendment of his blood. Again, probably an arranged marriage. Thomas Chaucer was knighted by Edward III and rose to be five times Speaker of the House of Commons. <clears throat> he was also guardian to Sir Thomas Stoner of the neighboring Stoner Manor in Park during his minority as well. So plugged in now to that level of aristocracy. Um... We don't know a lot about Matilda. She and Chaucer appear to have lived happily, happily at Ulm uh, when Thomas wasn't in London on speaker's business, and they're commemorated in a handsome grey granite polished altar tomb at St. John Baptist Chapel, Chapel at Ulm Church, their effigies being two full-length brasses of the best period, the whole tomb decorated with a coat of arms that they got um, in color, and those of noble and royal families with whom they were connected. Um, so the root wheel and the Plantagenet leopards being prominent amongst the heraldic devices. It's said that Thomas and Matilda entertained Edward III at, at, <clears throat> at the manor, and also John of Gaunt, who must have visited his godson and protege quite regularly. Thomas, on more than one occasion, with his wife Catherine, Matilda's sil sis Catherine, who was Matilda's sister, um, and, and it is likely that they... they noticed the child Alice, who doubtless showed early promise of beauty and strong will. So Alice Chaucer, born 1404, um, had, had a great and spectacular future reserved for her. As I say, she was betrothed early on to this knight, Sir John uh, Philip, knight of Norfolk, uh, who died before she was 12 years old, so that was never consummated. Later, she married um, an ambitious she, had an, she made an ambitious marriage with the Earl of Salisbury, Thomas Montacute, who was then in command of the English army in France under William de la Pole, uh, then Earl and later Duke of Suffolk. Thomas Montacute uh, was the opposer of John of Arc at Orléans and was described as being a man more like the old Romans than people of his own age. So great were his virtues and his, and his chivalry. He was killed at the siege of Orléans in 1428. And Alice was left a nobleman's widow and, and Countess of Salisbury at that point as well, thanks to her husband, now dead. Um, she must have made acquaintance with William de la Pole, uh, who, who, who was uh, then Earl of Suffolk, 
during Salisbury's lifetime, and she was she was also in France with her husband in the English army, which he was commanding under de la Pole. So de la Pole was the supreme commander under the king. Two years after her husband's death, Alice married William de la Pole uh, in 1430, she being then about 27 years of, of age and William about 34. So we may conclude that their marriage may well have been one of mutual attraction, as the pair seemed to have lived happily together until William's tragic death. Alice must have been loved and respected by both her husbands, who entreated her with matters of entrusted her with matters of business, and William de la Pole certainly carried out his plans for the betterment of Ulm and the construction of the church, school, and almshouses, which you can see in some of the images um, there, with Alice's help and advice. Uh, and William de la Pole would become a duke, <clears throat> um, and, and that would elevate Alice to the status of duchess. We, uh, from his, from, we know that, that William was an ambassador, uh, no, sorry, I've, I've skipped ahead a little bit. I'll, I'll let you look in the notes and see the, the details for what they're worth. But this, you know, clearly indicates, um, an example of a good marriage. Uh, we don't, you know, good in the sense of, of being financially profitable of elevating its, in, in, the individuals involved into higher status. We don't know what Chaucer and his wife were like, if they loved each other or not. Looks like they probably didn't, based on the Canterbury Tales. It looks like Alice and, um, and William might have gotten along pretty well. It may have been, as, as the source suggests, you know, one, one of a marriage of mutual attraction, but there will have been that financial element as well he will have seen her, her lands and holdings and she will have seen his lands and holdings and status and, and, and the two you know, were a good match financially and, and status oriented. Now, I mentioned some of the other women who, who, who do quite well for themselves in this era. Uh, one of them is a woman named Margaret Russell of Coventry. She was an exceedingly wealthy female merchant um, and one of, just one of her ventures to Spain, we're told, consisted of goods worth 800 pounds. So here's a woman who is is acting as a merchant, doing a, effectively a man's job and getting ahead in life. Um, and and some did, some did this. They skirted the rules around marriage, maybe getting marriage, but maybe dominating their husbands, um, or, or you know remaining uh, widows if their husbands died. I mentioned Queen Isabella, sometimes called the She Wolf of France. Edward II's wife, um, just to remind you of what she accomplished, um, traveling to France under the guise of a diplomatic mission while her husband was having dalliances with his boyfriends, Isabella began an affair with Roger Mortimer. <clears throat> the two agreed to depose Edward and oust the Dispenser family, the, the male lover's family of, of the king. She returned to England with a small mercenary army in 1326, Moving rapidly across England, Edward's forces deserted him. Isabella deposed Edward, becoming regent on behalf of their son, Edward III. Um, and most people think that she arranged for the murder of her husband, Edward II. She and Mortimer's regime began to crumble, though, thanks in part to her lavish spending, but also due to her, uh, to Isabella successfully, but unpopularly receiving long-running problems, resolving long-running problems, such as the wars with Scotland. Um, and of course she gets Mortimer gets killed and Edward III deposes her and, and doesn't kill her he just locks her away in a castle somewhere um, she's a, a popular sort of femme fatale figure <clears throat> one thing we notice um, about families and children amongst the, the works of art that survive and you can see some examples here um, there's a general absence of children from a lot of the medieval imagery. There is some, and I've put some up that you can see. Perhaps this is reflected a reflection of the high rate of infant mortality, again about 50% infant mortality rates. There were frequent births and frequent deaths among children. <coughs> Pardon me. And this might have been, um, you know, the, the reason for not depicting them, it might have been that, that they, they, you know, 
didn't become too attached to them until they were of a certain age and looked like they were going to survive? I'm not sure. I'm not sure we know the answer to this. When, when they are depicted, as you can see in the illustrations that I put up, they're often shown as miniature versions of adults, <clears throat> um, which is an interesting thing. And it's not to say there wasn't a childhood, although the concept of childhood as we understand it is, is a relatively modern one, it seems. Childishness and impetuosity seem to be a feature of medieval behavior. Think about Theseus in the Knight's Tale um, being so offended that someone might be weeping on a day of his celebration. Very narcissistic attitudes. Um, and remember that, of course, we reckon half the population might have been, you know, under about 25 years of age, about around that age, throughout much of the 14th century, thanks to the Black Death and these other factors. So maybe the emphasis is more on youth and old age as well. So for those who do manage to live into ripe old age, there is um, another issue awaiting. So uh, this theme, which, which seems popular throughout the literature, and we've seen it already once or twice in, in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, we'll see it in The Merchant's Tale, uh, has to do with an older husband marrying a younger wife and the sort of problems that arise with that. So imagine, you know, people living who have survived the Black Death, a, a select few, but some who do, end up being quite wealthy in old age, but wanting a wife. So they, they get someone younger than them. And uh, as I say, this, this theme running throughout a lot of the Canterbury Tales has to do, or several of them, has to do with an older man and the problems of a younger wife. So think about Alice in the, Mir the Miller's Tale uh, cheating on her old codger of a husband because she's quite young with the young student. Um, and, and this isn't the only example. The, the big one, of course, is, is the uh, Merchant's Tale. Um, and there's a concern that by elderly husbands that they're going to be cuckolded by their wives. So, but was, was this mirrored in reality? It, it probably was. And we have one famous example, um, at least, and that's Edward III and Alice Perrers. Who was Alice Perrers? Well, she was the royal mistress who had relations with Edward III um, and acquired significant land holdings. Perrers served as lady-in-waiting to Queen Philippa, Edward's wife, but became Edward's mistress before his wife's death. She was a, a lady-in-waiting. Chaucer's wife was a lady-in-waiting to the Queen. It, mean, it means that Chaucer's wife knew uh, Alice Perrers, and, and therefore Chaucer probably did as well. She is thought to be the model for the wife of Bath, although that's, that's unproven. Um, at any rate, she became Edward's lover um, and mistress before his wife's death. However, the scandal was kept quiet until after Queen Philippa's death, after which the king began to lavish gifts upon Alice Perrers. She was given property and even a selection of the late queen's jewels. Dressed in golden garments, Alice was paraded as the Lady of the Sun by the king's command. Though Perrers was given many gifts and land grants, her financial success was largely earned, as it happens. Some contemporaries claim that she'd seduced the sea She was already rich before she started getting stuff from the king. Granted, the king uh, enriched her even further. Um, some contemporaries claim that she'd seduced the senile old king to gain property and goods, but most of her acquisitions were, were owed to her intelligence, business acumen, use of contacts, and she became a wealthy landowner. So she's taking full advantage of, the, of what the position has afforded her, but it's her own business acumen that's made her a fortune. At one point, she controlled over 56 manors surrounding London, only 15 of which were gifts from the king. 56, 15 of which were from the king. Uh, among other properties, she possessed a manor at, at Gaines in Essex, in which Shy Richard de Perros, believed to be by some to be her father, uh, was the sheriff for many years. Cushy position for her father. In 1367, she held in custody the lands of Robert de Tilloil, um, and on the 30th of June, Perros and her heirs were granted a plot of land called Many Laws. So a lot of territory, a lot of lands. She was considered a great beauty, but, but John Wycliffe described her as the devil's tool. Um, she gets accused of witchcraft at one point of using magic potions on the king. Uh, 
She wore the dead, she wore the dead queen's jewels in public and was widely believed to have had an inappropriate influence on Edward III. Pardon me. And as I said, she was said to have used magic spells or love potions against him or talismans. Um, and, and her physician was arrested on charge of, of making love potions, but she wasn't. Perros uh, and the abbot of St. Albans engaged in a dispute over land. Prior to Edward's death, few would dare prosecute or challenge her, but, but that changed in 1377 when he died, and she was banished by Parliament with her lands forfeit. However, um, as a testament to her, uh, again, her, her cleverness, she returned to England with her lawyers. Uh, she, may have, she may have never gone, actually, but, but she, she had to pretend to leave. She returned with her lawyers and worked to regain quite a bit of her land. So um, quite an admirable, quite an interesting figure, this, this Alice Perros. Was she taking advantage of the king? Was, um, yeah, who knows? She's thought to have served as the living prototype of Chaucer's often married wife of Bath in the Canterbury Tales. Um, and her influence on literature has also been, have, it may have extended to, to Piers Plowman and Lady Mead, a character from there. The lady represents uh, to the dreaming narrator a woman of high status, one adorned with jewels and fine robes, but also as a, as a distraction and diversion from decent morals. Um, vocabulary term is the Synex Amans. This means elderly or aged lover. And that's what Edward III would have been, or what Sir January in the Merchant's Tale is. And this was a stock character in medieval fablio, so it's it's not one of Chaucer's inventions necessarily. We might think of him as an old goat. Um, often, so the, from, from the fablio, uh, they're generally characterized by excessiveness of sexual and scatological obscenity. Um, they like romance, and these figure into courtly romances, classical comedies, etc., an ugly, old, jealous man who's married to a younger, attractive, and often unhappy woman. Uh, he's a poor lover or even impotent, with bad breath, wrinkled skin, gray hair, frequently cuckolded by the younger, more handsome, virile man who secretly seduces his wife. We find examples in Chaucer's Miller's Tale, The Merchant's Tale, and various other fablio that existed. Um, likewise, the theme also appears in the medieval French uh, lays, stories that were told, such as Marie de France's uh, Golgemar, and similar works such as Tristan, Tristan and his Salt. Um, the motif of the Synex Amans often becomes useful for fast characterization, since it often can quickly cast a predator, uh, predatory light on an elderly male antagonist. An example of such use would be the old king of Ghana pursuing the young um, Imoinda in Afrobenz or Inoko. Uh, or any of the aging aristocrats sadistically pursuing young virtuous peasant girls in gothic novels. So um, we know this stereotype, it, it's, it's with us today, and it was certainly a part of their literature, and it, it, as I say, it figures into um, Chaucer's tale. So where does Chaucer stand in this debate about women and marriage and these things? Well, we've got Sir January in The Merchant's Tale, which I'll just introduce now, and that'll be the end. Uh, he's a 60-year-old knight in his quest for a young wife. Uh, is it a double standard on promiscuity? He gets advice from his friends, both for and against marrying anyone at all, never mind a younger person. May is chosen. Um, the marriage is engineered by some of January's friends, sacralized by the church. There's a horrible scene of consummation where, after they're married, um, Pretty, pretty gross. He's not able to perform, but anyway. The marriage is unsatisfactory and ends up causing adultery. What is Chaucer thinking? Is he, is he advocating a return to, to male dominance? Is he displaying misogyny or sympathy for women? Um, think about these things. Are men depicted as cruel and thoughtless, um, whether rapists or courtly lovers? Does Chaucer sympathize with women? Is there a proto-feminism in um, in, in Chaucer, has the Black Death transformed, albeit temporarily, women's social and economic situation? Where is love and respect? These are all questions to think about. Now, I mentioned there's 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 anti-matrimonialism. There's also there's no such thing as feminism in Chaucer's era, but there's something called anti-feminism, and this is the kind of rhetoric you find, especially amongst clerical writings, 
um, against women, often using invoking Eve as an example. So there is anti-feminism, um, but there may well be proto-feminism in the case of Chaucer, and I'll leave it for you to decide that. We'll um, end that there for, for now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.